everyone, I'm Carol Ann Riddell and welcome to Book It with CA. We are so excited to debut a new segment this month, book reviews with columnist and author Linda Stacy. She's got plenty to say about lots of things. You won't want to miss it. But first, we head to the kitchen. We are talking feast and fiction with author Andrew Cotto, who loves all things Italy, especially the food and wine. Hey, Andrew, thanks so much for being with us today. Hi, Carolyn, thanks for having me. So there is a reason that we are talking about books from our kitchens, and that's because you're gonna do a little cooking for us later. Uh, but before we get to that, let's start with your recent book, Cucina Romana. Tell us a little bit about the story and how it unfolds. Sure, well, Cucina Romana is a sequel to Cucina, Cucina Tipica, which ends with our protagonist, um, acquiring a hotel outside of Florence in the hills that will allow him to stay in Italy forever, which is, is, is his dream. Uh, the novel picks up with him going down to Rome to pursue some of the, the um, bureaucratic obstacles that, that, that prevent making only a hotel in, in Italy a, a, a simple procedure. So they go down to Rome, and when they're in Rome, seeing it for the first time through his eyes, um, uh, a, a new sort of adventure ensues regarding some possible link to um, ancestry. And, and tell us a little about, about him, because as you said, um, your readers have met him before. How has he changed between that time and now? Yeah, it's a great question, because like characters have to change, right? If a character's beginning of the book is the same as the end of the book, nothing really happened of, of import. Yeah. The character of Jacoby, and this, this time around, is much happier. And, and Jacoby is also sort of searching for his roots, right? He's kind of trying to figure out his ancestry in Italy. Uh, and I think that that is something that a lot of people can relate to, the sense of wanting to understand where we come from. So what do you hope that readers take away from that? In the case of, you know, Jacoby, it's really more of just a, a validation for his desire to stay in Italy, right? He loves the country. It's like, this is like, this is really a love story between a man and a place. And when he falls in love with Italy, he wants to find some sort of validation that, that he belongs there beyond just his own sort of sense of, of well-being there. So an, an ancestry link would, would accomplish that. It also helps inform our plot. I'm really using ancestry here more as a plot device and a theme. Right, I understand what you're saying. You know, in some ways the book reads almost like, you know, a travel diary because the descriptions of food and drink are so specific and so central to the book um, that, you know, it's, it's almost unbelievable. It's hard to believe you're not actually eating when you're writing it. I like to, to you know, have characters engage in the act of eating because um, it, 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 and cooking for each other. It, it's, it's communal. I mean, it, it adds to the, the, the ambiance of the story. It, great, it offers great sensory opportunities. You know, I mean, the, people love describing surroundings, the sky and the trees, etc. I love that too. But I mean, when you incorporate food, it allows another piece of that that the reader can really engage with, you know, and I find it very effective. Where does your love for all things Italy come from? Well, I'm Italian-American, right? So I grew up, you know, in one of those big New York Italian-American families where every Sunday I was at my grandmother's house. And, you know, the food was always a part about it that, that, that resonated the most with me. You know, some of the other trappings were I, I could live without. You know, I don't you know, need to hear Sinatra on the radio from, you know, dusk till dawn. Um, but I, I love the food part of it, not because only because my grandmother was such an amazing cook, but when we sat down around her table every single Sunday, and there was no exceptions, right? No, no soccer game or birthday party that would get you out of it. You were there every Sunday, every week of the year. You know, it was like church to me. You know, we were around the table, we were together, we were laughing, we, we, we were, we were, you know, in, in, we were cloaked in joy. And that stuck with me as something that I associated with food. So I grew up learning how to cook for my mother, um, cooking at restaurants in college and cooking as an adult, as a hobby. Um, than writing about food. And in your books, Andrew, it's not just the food, it's also the drinks that go with the food that are important. Can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, I, mean, I, 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 don't, I can't imagine food without wine, you know, maybe at breakfast, you know, but like, <laughs> you know, I mean, well, breakfast, breakfast, I can't. <laughs> I mean, they're just such, they, they, they go so well together. It's like, you, you can't eat a peanut butter sandwich without milk, I guess, when you're a kid, right? I can't eat really good food without wine because the, the pairing, you know, is, is just so important. So yes, this is really a food filled, but also a wine soaked adventure. Both books are. You know, as I mentioned, your descriptions of meals are so vivid in the book. Is there a short one you'd like to read for us? 
Sure. This this particular meal here is, is, is Jacoby's first meal in Rome, right? And Rome is, is most famous um, for its pastas, right? The carbonara, the gliccia, the cacio pepe, um, the matriciana. And, and this is Jacoby's real first introduction to the pastas of, of Rome. He's with his, 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 his business partner and best friend, Bill, um, down in Rome the first night they get there. Jacoby liked the aesthetic already. Long tubes of tonarello, a glow in the silky sheen of translucent sauce with grated white cheese and lots of cracked black pepper. The tang of the pepper tapped Jacoby's nose, backed by the pronounced yet mellow aroma of the cheese. Why no banchale here, Jacoby asked. Oh, Bill rose from his lurch forward to inhale the fragrance of the pasta. Traditionalists have meat out of this plate, leading it to simply three ingredients. Pasta, typically tonarello, like we have here, cheese, pecorino romano, and of course, black pepper. That's it. That's it. So that's just a really quick description of, a, of cacio pepe, which is also one of my favorite um, pasta dishes. It's, it's a classic Roman dish of just, you know, it, it's the epitome of what makes Italian food so good in my mind, because it, it's, it's salt. I mean, it's pepper, cheese, pasta, and water. And it's yeah. spectacular, right? And I'm going to make a similar dish here. I'm going to make carbonara for you in a few minutes, which is a, which is a step up, but almost as simple. So, you know, you mentioned Jacoby's first meal in Rome in the book. What would be your first meal in Italy? <laughs> if we had more time, I would give you my top 50. Um, but I, I, I love so many different parts of Italian cuisine and the regions, all 20 regions have had different highlights and that, that appeal to me. But my favorite place in all of Italy is not only because the food there is so great, because the, the ambiance epit epitomizes what Italian cuisine is to me. And that's um, the, uh, there's a, there's a butcher in, in Chianti country, um, in the area between Florence and Siena. His name is Dario Cecchini. He's, uh, he's considered the world's most famous butcher. Um, he said he's friends with Springsteen and Jack Nicholson and all sorts of celebrities, but he's also the down salt of the earth human being who is the best butcher, um, you know, as far as, you know, in my mind, right? Not that I rank my butchers, but like, you know, he has a steak restaurant from his meat in that area, the Kenton Giamma Cow, the special Bistec Fiorentina. It's called the Ufucina di Bisteca, the office of meat, right? And I love Dara as a human being. Um, a chef's Table, season six, episode two, features Dario, um, and he is just a, 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 a man who you know, appreciates what food brings to our lives more than anyone else I've ever ever known. So eating his food is, is, is and being in his presence too is a huge personality and a monster of a man. Uh, he's, he's an aficionado of, uh, of, of the Divine Comedy, so he's spouting off of, of cantos from uh, Dante's Inferno. Um, he's just a, an amazing theater performer in his, in his own auspices, but also just a great human being. So I really like his food more than anyone else's. So Andrew, while I was reading your book, I found myself longing for a really authentic Italian dish. And lucky for us, you are actually gonna create one for us. But I should say, please try to keep it simple because cooking is not my strength and I would love to try to replicate this at home. So before we get to what you're actually making, I also wanna say that I love wine when I cook or when other people cook. So I'm pouring a glass of Chianti here. And now, <laughs> Oh, I see you have an Aperol Spritz. I do. Salute. Very nice. Very nice. Chin chin. <laughs> Let's hit it, Andrew. What are you going to make? My favorite question. I'm making classic pasta carbonara here, right? Which is which is one of the signature dishes of Rome. It's featured in the book, of course. And really, it, it, it's nothing more than bacon, egg, and cheese. You know, the bacon here is actually not bacon, like, you know, Oscar Mayer bacon is guanciale, right? Which is the, 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 the jowl of a hog, which is cured, right? It's far more, oh, look at all the fat in it, right? That layer of fat with the, with the meat, you know, that just, you, you render that down, which I've already done, right? I have that here, rendered down into little matchsticks, right? Cut it into matchsticks. Um, of course, eggs are important, and we're talking of the large organic eggs. You take the yolks, right? Again, the recipe is going to be simple, right? It is a pound of pasta. This is four people. A pound of pasta, four egg yolks, right? One cup of Pecorino Romano cheese. That's it. And pasta and pasta water. And I'll show you why the, the pasta water is so important in a minute. Let me, let me put the pasta in right, and get it going. Okay. So you're saying the water is actually part of the recipe. Don't throw water. Is part of the recipe, yes. We okay. pour water heavily. This is like, this is like the Adriatic Sea. We use so much salt, right? right. Okay. 
That's new to me. I didn't know that, but I think I can handle that number of ingredients at least. I'm using fresh pasta here um, because I want to cook quickly. You could use dry pasta at home, of course. We have a little window here, so I'm going to use fresh pasta to cook quickly. We're going to cook it short of what they call al dente, right? We know that if your pasta is 10 minutes, for your dry pasta is 10 minutes by instruction, you typically cook it eight. In this case here, I'm cooking it just short of al dente because it's going straight into my egg. It's not going straight into a sauce. A lot of salt, a lot of pasta is finished, right? So our pasta's in. Just wait, back up for one second there, Andrew. So the pasta goes directly into the cracked eggs. Right. We do not drain when we make Italian pasta, right? You know, the Italians take the pasta straight from the bowl where it's, where it's boiling. Okay. And a hot pan where the sauce is cooking and it finishes in the sauce so it absorbs the sauce as the last step in the cooking process, which is why pasta at a restaurant usually tastes better than pasta at home because Italian chefs and restaurants know to do that. Right? Oh my gosh, I never knew that. It's, this a is great, it's a great way. Um, when you're using a, a, a cool sauce or a room temperature sauce like this one, I'll let it, I'll let it cook a little bit further. You know, and I'm, but I'm also going to incorporate as much water as I possibly can okay, from, the, from the pasta because that water is thick. That water now has starch in it, right? All the starch comes off the pasta itself, right? And it's in the water. So this water is now, is a, it's not just water, it's a thickening agent. So I have this egg. I'm going to whip in right, um, pecorino romano cheese. Right, into the sauce. So I'm gonna put it right here in the stove. Notice that my stove is not hot. If my stove was hot over here, I'd be having scrambled eggs right now, right? So <laughs> I'm whipping in my Pecorino Romano cheese. And when you make pastas from Rome, you use Pecorino Romano. You don't use Parmigiano. You use Parmigiano for, for other pastas, right? So I've got a little bit of an emulsion going here, right? Of egg and cheese. It's gonna get thick in a second Right, when I put in some pasta with the water. I'm gonna take this pasta in. Just right into the eggs. Right in it, then I'm turning, now I'm making an emulsion, right? I'm, the water from the pasta is blending with the eggs and the cheese. Right? Did you add extra water to that bowl or just the water that was already sort of part of it? The idea would be uh, just the water from the from the, the pasta because it's clinging to the pasta, right? But we're going to save some of this water in case we need to do that. People do do that often. When they make pasta, they will save a cup of water to make sure the sauce needs to be stretched a little bit or, or smoothed out a little bit. And that will so you don't want to use just regular water. You want to use the water that the pasta already cooked in. Yeah. It's no, it's no longer just regular water. It's magic water, right? It's ah, it's magic water. water. And what you have here is something so creamy. You can see this, right? Yeah, looks delicious. Pasta coming, but it's not. There's no sauce dripping off, right? Because the sauce is clean. It's the exact balance of sauce and noodle, right? This, these noodles are dressed, right? You know, perfectly in the sauce. So I'm going to plate it. Dressed to impress. Dressed to impress. <laughs> Good one. I'm going to use that. Now I'm not doing that fancy twisty thing where people do these days when they make a like a little tortilla pasta. I just put the pasta on the plate. Right? Single portion right here. What I do here. So to gild the lilies, I take that. So I rendered down that guanciale before. Remember, this is what this is. You know, this is these chunks of of, of hog jowl, right? They're yes. sticks now. They're, they're crunchy. Yeah, they look. You can hear the crunching in my head. Yeah. So I, do, I, I make a little nest in the middle. Oh, these are so good. <laughs> I'm getting jealous over here. You no, know, I know. I'm killing you. And I make a little nest of guanciale. I take some of the drippings from the guan cha that I saved and I okay. work with it. Like some people might put olive oil at the end of their, their pasta, which is great, right? But a little bit, this is a, this is the drippings from the guan cha, like a little bit of extra fat. Got it. And of course, to have it be carbonata, which was invented by the coal miners of Rome, right? We need carbon, which is coal. I use pepper. Okay. So a nice sprinkling of pepper. You can add some fresh cheese, which I will do. A little sloppily. There goes my presentation. Then you have this beautiful pasta. Can you hold it up? Oh, yes. Can you see it okay? Great. Now, I didn't realize that the meat stayed just in the center or didn't get blended in. It looks beautiful. Yeah, you, you can blend it if you want. I think it looks a little cool, kind of cool like this. And then you blend it when you take a bite, which I'm about to do. Yeah, Andrew, do taste test for us, okay? If you insist. I do. That's perfect. 
It's perfect. Oh my gosh. You know, you know. How do you know it's perfect? Like what? I mean, I know you always have a sophisticated palate for this, but how would I know like that's really perfect? Yeah, I, I, there's, there's a great answer for that. When the pasta itself tastes like the sauce. Okay. It's not like the pasta, there's pasta in your mouth and there's sauce in your mouth. The pasta and the sauce have become one, right? It, it, it is gastronomic matrimony, right? Okay, I got it. So I know you also, as you said, write for magazines. Is that a lot different than writing fiction in terms of your process? Yeah, I mean, it, it's like playing guitar and playing bass maybe in the musician's realm. You know, they're, they're, they're different, but they're the same. I, I love the short form of journalism. So it allows me to, to sort of, you know, you know use my, my, my talent in other areas besides novels. It's also, you know, quick. I mean, the short form, seeing a byline every week feels good, you know, just to be their stories and be active, get your name out there. It also allows me to tell other people's stories. I mean, when I'm, most of what I cover in journalism is food and, and news and things around New York City, but they're always focused on the people that are involved in those things. So I love telling people's stories and sharing their stories, right? especially those who haven't been heard otherwise. Um, so it's very validating in that respect. And then, and I, I swear, I, I make so many friends <laughs> by doing it. Yeah, I bet you do. I bet you do. Well, as you said, food is so central to all of us, right? And never more so than it has been in this last, you know, year plus. Oh, I, I, I'm, I was obviously on board with the importance of food in our lives. And I'd written an article before the lockdown about, you know, comparing, you know, well-being, you know, mental health to how we eat. Right? You, know, you know, the idea was that there's people who live to eat and people who eat to live. And obviously I, I was one of the, the former, right? I mean, it's so important to me, but it wasn't just because like it's fun and you get to go out and oh my God, that was so good. I, I think food provides them so much more to our, our, our existence than most people give it credit for. Um, so and do I, you do most of the cooking in your family? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I do all I do all the cooking, you know, at least the, the dinners, right? People make sandwiches and breakfast, et cetera. But, uh, you know, I, I'm the cook here and, and um, you know, it, it's, 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 it's something that I get to do every single day that I enjoy immensely too. So it brings me joy, you know, and, and pleasure. And I'm always thinking, what's, what's my next meal? What's my next meal? A, 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 you know, a little quip I always have is that if I ever wrote a memoir, it'd be called Killing Time Between Meals. They're basically just finding ways to like stay busy until my next meal. So I look so forward to it. You know, well, you know, in the book, Andrew, also Jacoby really enjoys a meal. Is there um, another part of his character that is similar to you? Or do you base any characters on real people to some degree? Yeah, they're always based on, you know, I, I sort of like do the old, you know, uh, amalgam thing where I take a little bit of this person, a little bit of that person, you know, put them together and let my imagination sort of make them into something wholly unique. Jacoby, in this case, though, I don't know where I got him from. You know, I mean, where he lived where he lives in, in Florence, outside, in the hills south of Florence is where I lived for a year at one point in my life. The people that he knows there are people that I knew there. You know, so it's very much rooted in my own experiences, my extensive experiences in Italy. Right? But the character himself, I, I, he's not me. I mean, I, you know, we, we have nothing in common um, except that we love food. And I think that was partially because I was just trying to focus more when I, when I jump started this, you know, on you know, you know, someone who's significantly younger than I am too, and, and, and going through things that I hadn't discovered, but, you know, um, wanting, the, you know, to have a whole unique person, you know, uh, on this journey. So it, that one's not me. That's interesting. Talking about Jacoby as a character, um, it's interesting to sort of understand how he ends up in Italy to begin with, is, which happens in, in the earlier book, but can you just explain that? Yeah, um, in, in the earlier, in the previous book, the backstory is that, you know, um, he was living, he was a musician um, um, who pivoted towards a, a, a career in PR in the record business, you know, sort of took his, his, his skills for communications into a PR firm. And he, he had, they didn't call it cancel culture then at the time when I wrote the book, but it was this idea that he made a mistake at work. He sent out a text message to a colleague thinking it was just to a colleague with a joke those two would only get. It went to the whole team and then the joke wasn't interpreted. It was taken out of context and he was fired for it. Um, and not just fired, but also sort of humiliated and, and, and relegated to being unemployable. And so, you know, he, he's depressed. His fiance is a travel writer and a food writer, and she gets a gig in Italy for a travel um, guide that takes the, they'll take them there for a year. You know, so they, they go, she thinks an escape to Italy will, will soothe him and help him, you know, um, be invigorated and re be ready to return to New York at some point. Um, and what happens, he gets there and says, I'm not, I'm not going back, sorry. 
Right. The cautionary tale about the, the dreaded reply all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's actually fairly humorous. You know, it doesn't, the, the result isn't funny, but the circumstances are kind of funny. So is there more ahead for Jacoby? Are you going to continue to write about him? Yeah, the ending of this book, you know, I, I'm not a huge, like, you know, cliffhanger, plot twist, oh my goodness type person at the end of my books. I like, you know, to have happy endings, right? Everything works out great, la la la, let's go have dinner. Um, this one, I, I spun so hard at the end, and I set it up fairly well, you know, and it, it is definitely one of those, oh my goodness endings, you know, that I think is working. Most of the validation I'm getting, most of the response I'm getting is very validating. There's a couple, like, people go, well, I didn't get where it, what that was about. Um, but for over, the overwhelming majority of responses has gotten the ending, which begs for a, another series. You have to, I have to explain what happens at the end. Right? So I, I basically have like an ellipsis at the end of it, like a soap, like a soap opera right? to be continued. Um, and it will be continued. They're going to go to the Amalfi Coast and they're going to have, you know, similar, you know, food filled wine soaked adventures. And I'm just thinking I'm going to keep it going. And as long as I can sustain, you know, enough plot. Andrew, thank you so much for all of this time. It was really so fun to meet you and to get to talk about books and food and all these things that I also love. And so happy eating and cheers to you as we say goodbye. Thank you so much for having me and cheers to you. Now we kick off a new and regular segment, Uncensored with Linda Stacy. As our fans already know, Linda is an award-winning author and columnist who is not afraid to share exactly what she thinks. In every episode, she'll tell us about books she loves and definitely does not love with a big brash dose of the story behind the story. Linda spent some time hanging out at Royal 35 Steakhouse to bring you Uncensored. In my ridiculously long career, I think I've worn more hats than Billy Porter at an award show. Reporter, columnist, TV host, author, novelist, critic, and reviewer. All of which brings me right here, right now, to what I love best, books. I like writing them, but I love reading them. So let's start with a book that was written in 1954, but not published for over 66 years. It's inseparable by the great French existentialist, writer, and feminist author, Simone de Beauvoir. The intro is by Margaret Atwood, and she explains that this novel was dismissed by de Beauvoir's lover, the equally infamous Jean-Paul Sartre, as inconsequential. No, he wasn't being a misogynist. Well, actually, he was a big misogynist, but not in this case. In this case, I think he was right. This is the fictionalized story of young Simone's adoration of her school friend, the exceptional Andrea. However, Andrea doesn't seem to be exceptional at all. She just seems to be boring. The book consists of two very long chapters without a middle, very pretentious. Not much of a story arc, more like, ah, just a big straight line. This is the retelling of how the girls met in lower school and remain friends until her friend falls hard for some big dud of a guy and promptly drops dead of a fever. We have no idea what kind of fever, she just drops dead of a fever. Even though de Beauvoir was bisexual and infamously so, the two girls are not lovers. But you know what? De Beauvoir's real story is much more, well, not interesting, but sordid. As a teacher, she had sex with her underage female students that she groomed for Sartre. After she got the boot, she and Sartre fought to have the age of consent in France lowered from 15. To what? Birth? Back then, they were called intellectual liberal thinkers. Today, we have a better name, child predators. Look, I am forever grateful to Ms. Beauvoir for introducing a whole new kind of feminism to the world. But you know what? There's a reason this book wasn't published. Despite the current and very knee-jerk raves from the reviewers, I found Inseparable to be, well, insufferable. The next book is one that's so good, I'd say it's addictive, but that would be in such incredibly bad taste, I won't say it. It's called Empire of Pain, The Secret History of the Sackler Dynasty, and it's by Patrick Radden Keith. It's the unvarnished, very sordid history of the family who owned Purdue Pharma, the very ones who invented and pushed opioids for pain. This book traces the Sackler family 
And get this, they were all doctors who gave huge money to get their names on museums and colleges and everything else that would give them social access. What they didn't put their names on was what made them rich, Oxycontin. They knew it was addictive, but they kept urging docs to up and up the dosages. They even bribed doctors until patients were hopelessly addicted. Now, 130 Americans die every single day from opioids. In this book, the Sacklers are like the Manson family of medicine. Sure, I know, they finally got brought down by lawsuits in the court. Too bad, they're still billionaires. And I'm still uncensored, and I'm Linda Stacy. wraps up another chapter of our show. Thanks so much for joining us. A quick reminder, check us out on social media. We would love to hear from you, especially if you disagree with Linda. We'll both be back next time on Book It With CA. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. See you then.